Praise the Lord. How great it is to sing of the grace of God this morning. We're here gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ as one body, as one church. And so let us lift this praise. Praise the name of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let us turn to Acts chapter 19 this morning. Um, so in the past weeks, we have been covering Acts chapter 19. Um, we're covering various topics in that chapter. And Acts chapter 19 uh, chronicles Paul's two-and-a-half-year ministry in Ephesus. And uh, Luke highlights key events and uh, recounts some of the ways the Holy Spirit uh, uses Paul. And, and uh, so we, we've been talking about how uh, Paul's ministry um, affected the, the people in, in Ephesus. Um, and before, uh, before we start into uh, chapter 19, we see Apollos being mentioned. Apollos' ministry uh, that uh, begins in Ephesus. He's from Alexandria, uh, but he starts his ministry in Ephesus. And, and he has very... Paul, uh, I'm sorry, Luke expresses Apollos' ministry um, very positively uh, and... You know, but at the same time, Apollos did not have all of his theological ducks in order you know, when it came to water baptism. And we talked about earlier how Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, when we start in uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 1, it says that Apollos uh, wanted to go to Achaia, which is Corinth, and the church encouraged them and wrote a letter to the disciples in Achaia to welcome him, you know. And this was a practice so that no, a false teacher just couldn't come into a, a church and just start preaching a false gospel. This is a letter of recommendation. Um, and so, and it, he talks very positively about Apollos that, you know, he uh, powerfully refuted the Jews and demonstrated through scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And, you know, in the Corinth, really, the movement in Corinth started by Paul. And, you know, those of us who are uh, familiar with 1 Corinthians, and when he talk, Paul talks about the divisions in the church, there's a group for Paul, there's a group for Apollos, you know. And uh, Paul describes that difference in the ministry and in this way, saying that, you know, I planted, Apollos watered, but God's, God was causing the growth. And I just want to give that background as we now move forward in uh, Acts chapter 19. Um, and, and I will read that here, Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7. And it happened that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into then what were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Amen. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And they were about 12 men in all. So this is Paul's second time in Ephesus. And like I mentioned, uh, this whole chapter in 19 is going to chronicle Paul's two and a half ministry in Ephesus. Um, the first time he came, came to Ephesus is with Priscilla and Aquila. Um, and there he reasons with the Jews in the synagogues. And it says that he left them both there. He left uh, Aquila and Priscilla there and said, told them that if God wills, he'll come and return. Uh, but what he does from there is he goes back to his home church, which is in Antioch. And we're in the third missionary journey where this is where Paul comes back through the churches that he has planted all through Asia. And uh, he is now in Ephesus. And... Uh, He's the purpose of Paul's third missionary journey. Uh, one of the purposes is to strengthen the disciples. 
And in the same mission, he comes um, to Ephesus, and as we just read, he comes across some disciples. These are not Jewish, uh, these are not Jewish, uh, just strictly Jews. Uh, these are not people that were sympathetic to the Christian message. Here, in, even in Greek, that word disciple is the same word used for those, uh, Jesus' disciples as well. Uh, so these are disciples of Christ, but you know, one scholar coins these disciples as deficient disciples, and I'm, I will use that term throughout this message this morning. Uh, these are not uh, disciples that are fully, uh, fully aware of the full gospel. These are deficient. They're, they're deficient in some things. And so when we go down this verses, we can see, you know, these are uh, disciples that understand the Old Testament scriptures. They they focused a lot about the connections between, you know, the Old Testament prophecies and what happened in the Gospels. And, and so these are, and these are people that believed in the Gospel message. They believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So these are, uh, these are not just people that are, you know, non-Christians. These are disciples, but they are baby disciples. And, and um, so I, I make this distinction to make the point that you know, we become Christians by faith in Jesus Christ. And it is none of our external actions or the maturity of our theology. It's not the, even the abundance of spiritual gifts that qualify us to be saved. It is we become Christians or the disciples of Christ merely by this trust in believing the fact that Jesus is the Savior who died for the, for the sins of humanity. And those who trust in him and repent and believe in him will have eternal life. And so these men, these 12 disciples that, uh, that we see here, are those who are in that state of mind. But at the same time, we know just that being a baby disciple is just not enough. Some, but sometimes we, we are content with that. You know, I was thinking, you know, if you ask a child, what do you want to be? Most of the time, they will tell you, I want to be, a, I want to be an astronaut. Have you heard a child say, I want to be a mediocre astronaut? I want to be the most incompetent astronaut there was ever to be. I want to be that person that, you know, breaks the toilet in the space station, that presses the wrong buttons, that causes chaos, maybe runs into a satellite in the space, you know. These, these are not things that we... we uh, we think a child or someone who ascribes to a future state uh, of, in their career, right? We, we always have great, uh, vi- a great vision to where we want to be. But, unfortunately for us, as disciples of Christ, we some, somehow settle for little. We settle for the minimum. We settle for just getting in the door, and that's it. I just want to... I just want my name in the book of life, and that's it. Like, that, that's all I need. I don't need, I don't, you know, I don't need to go anything beyond. I don't want to be like those super spiritual types or anything like that. I just, I just want to have the name that I'm a, I'm a name in the book of life. I just want to be a, a baby disciple. That's enough. But being satisfied with these initial teachings and the basic gospel is not enough. That's not what, to what we are saved for. We are saved to become in the image of Christ. We are saved for so much greater things. We are saved to be, uh, we're saved unto good works. We're saved to, to fulfill the purpose of God that he has on your life. He has given you the Holy Spirit so that you can build up the body of Christ. He has given you a calling, each one of you, as a disciple of Christ, to not only be discipled yourself, but to disciple others. Sometimes we emphasize the others part because we think we are ready and we can teach others. But first, you, you need to be discipled. You, you need to be under the spiritual teaching of someone who is able to teach you in the ways of God. And so we see here Paul taking that role for these 12 disciples. And so what are some of the ways that we see um, that these disciples are deficient? First, um, they were baptized, but it was the wrong baptism. They were baptized into the baptism of John. 
The baptism of John is essentially a baptism of repentance. It's a, it's a cleansing ritual, if you want to put it that way. It was a, a, a means for those to say, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I repent, and as a, as a symbolism of my repentance, I want to wash myself. I want to baptize in the waters. And the purpose of this baptism was only to prepare for the way of the Lord. I mean, John's whole ministry was to prepare for the Messiah to come. He, and so he preached repentance uh, and the kingdom to come. Um, and, uh, and so the, the purpose of that baptism at this juncture was obsolete. And so, and, but then John the Baptist says this, like, you know, in Luke 3.16, it may be on the screen, Luke 3.16, John says this, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, and the strap of those sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I'm not going to... Um, dwell on it, on this baptism of John too much, nor the baptism, the Christian baptism, but we do need to, as we now are talking about the topic, Christian baptism is vastly, vastly different. Christian baptism is, is standing on the finished work of Christ. We're declaring and we're witnessing to the world that we are dead to sin as Christ died uh, for, uh, with the sins of the world upon him, we are dying with Christ, right? When we are immersed in the water, we are buried with Christ. And when we come up out of the water, we're symbolically, we're saying, I'm resurrected with Christ. We are becoming one symbolically with the death, burial, and resurrection with Christ. And so just explaining it that way, for those who may be still learning this, you will see the vast difference between a, a mere baptism of repentance, which is uh, a, a act of contrition versus identifying with Christ Jesus. And this is the vast difference. And so, for, you know, some people will, you know, some people will say, well, these are semantics or these are, well, and then they just, then they dip themselves in the water. Why do we have to do, do this the right way? Well, here's the example in scripture. I can see doing this the right way is important. Doing, getting baptism right is important. It, it makes these disciples deficient. Um, and so, that is one way that we see Paul correcting them. The second way, which is mind-boggling to me, but these disciples, uh, when, when Paul asked them, have you, after you have believed, have you received the Holy Spirit? And whether Paul discerned that or Paul saw something like a disconnect, I'm not sure. But their response is very interesting. They say, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And it's how they respond. And so, you know, they didn't know anything about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And this also is a lesson for us, you know, depending on where, uh, who you listen to, uh, which church you go to, there's a tendency to emphasize one thing over the other thing. There's a tendency to overemphasize um, the, you know, the theological, Christological, you know, the, the, the Old Testament prophecies and, and to say, my, the art meditation is only on, on meditating on the fact of how Christ has been fulfilled in the Old Testament, yet we forget the full counsel of God, the full way of God. And there's also faults on the other side as well of emphasizing the experience, emphasizing the gifts without first talking about how was that made possible. It was made possible because of the finished work of Christ on the cross and Him ascending into heaven, asking the Father, right? He asked of the Father, and the Father poured out His Spirit upon all flesh as an answered prayer. So sometimes we overemphasize one thing over another, but this is where we have to do the hard work of marrying together the Word and the Spirit. The Word is important. The Spirit of God is important. We have to equally find these two, these two aspects um, key to our spiritual growth. Just to remind, I just mentioned it, but let me just remind you a couple of scripture portions, how Jesus emphasized the role of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not, when Jesus left, he did not just say, I have finished the work and uh, all right, uh, you guys go out and uh, preach the word. That's not what Jesus said. In In John 14, 16, I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth 
whom the world cannot receive, neither it sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will revisit this again at the end. So uh, I will revisit uh, this, um, this topic at the end. So let me uh, just move on forward. And so then um, Jesus says this right before the essential, ascension, Acts chapter 8, uh, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. These are two different ways that we see Jesus Christ talking about the essential, the, how essential it is to know the Holy Spirit, to receive Him in fullness and what He is able to do through us. If Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us and to give us power to be witnesses, we should wholeheartedly receive Jesus' promises for us. This should not be, even be of question. This is not an optional thing. For these, these deficient disciples, they weren't even aware of the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm speaking to some here, perhaps, that you have seen the, the works of the Holy Spirit manifested, perhaps, in ways that may not connect with you. You might uh, feel like it is uh, maybe perhaps a, bu- a bunch of emotion. You might think that it, this doesn't change you. But let me just reassure you that If you love Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, if you trust in what Jesus has done, here's his promise that he said, it is more advantageous for me to go so that I can send another helper for you, to be with you forever. It is for our good that Jesus left. And for Jesus to, to send the Holy Spirit means... Uh, means what? That we will have a comforter with us in all times, in our trials, in our, in our struggles. We'll also have to, to be witnesses in this world, which that's the reason why we're here, right? We're, we're, we're believers in Christ. We're out doing God's work uh, because we're called to do that, but we're not doing it alone. The Holy Spirit gives us the words to minister to others. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to minister, to, to do things that uh, that we could never do with our own strength, uh, whether it's to heal uh, people, whether it's to bring deliverance to the people by the power of the Holy Spirit, to, to speak and to prophesy, to, to discern the spirits. The, the, all these things are important for us. And I, I'm only stating the obvious just so that, uh, just so that we, we will not take this promise for granted. And we are living in a time where deficient disciples are being normalized. We think it's just, well, as long as they, they're part of the church, you're coming to church every week, that's enough. Unfortunately, deficient disciples are setting an agenda in churches. Deficient disciples are taking over spiritual leadership in churches. Deficient disciples are forcing those on pulpits to preach messages to tickle their ears and not to challenge their hearts. And when disciple, deficient disciples are in charge... It hurts the body of Christ. And this might be a tough saying, I, I, but I'm I saying it f- fully knowing well, perhaps the ramifications of it. But we need to look in ourselves and say, am I a deficient disciple of Christ? This is not about uh, setting classes of spirituality or classes of Christians. This is about effective and powerful ministry and a powerful life in the Spirit. And it is high time for deficient disciples to come into the fullness of biblical understanding and the fullness of the Spirit. As I mentioned, this, the Word and the Spirit marrying together. It's high time for deficient disciples to become whole and mature and growing to the stature of Christ. As I mentioned about the, the, the career goal of being an astronaut, and we have high and mighty goals for what we want to be in this world, we need to have high and mighty goals to the heavens as to what, our, what our, our vision is in Christ, to becoming in the full stature of Christ and what that means to each one of us, not just for this, this time and here on earth and this few years that we have, but also for all eternity. We're living for eternity. So it doesn't matter if you're in your teens, 20s or above. If you recognize 
something is lacking in your walk with Christ, if you recognize that you have a lack of biblical knowledge, if you recognize there is a lack of, uh, lack of the Spirit-filled, Spirit-controlled life, acknowledging that deficiency is the first step. There are many that do not acknowledge this, that just because you're married, just because you're in 30s or 40s or 50s, you think you are set to go. But unfortunately, there are individuals carrying on this deficiency all through their life just because of the societal acceptance of this deficient nature of discipleship. And I'm just reminding you that the first step of this is acknowledging each one of us looking in our life and saying, Where, am I being deficient in my walk as a disciple of Christ Jesus? And how are some ways that we can make, put ourselves in the position to grow in the knowledge of the Word and the Spirit? First, we need to be in fellowship with mature Christians. And I'm not talking about Christians in name only. I'm talking about this rock-solid, genuine Christians full of faith who are consistent and transparent, who are full of grace and full of the Spirit. And these 12 disciples, you know, these, this is like a peer group, you know. Same, let's just assume they're same age, same walk of life. They're talking amongst themselves. They're living, uh, you know, in, in community with each other. But this is like the blind leading the blind. This is like, you know, I mean, they can only share what they know. But this is where a Paul needs to come in. A, a, a older, a, 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 not just older, but a, a more mature, a, a, more, uh, a more knowledgeable uh, a person needs to be in, in, in the midst of that peer group to, to show the way of the Lord. And so in this fellowship that they had with Paul, they come to learn about baptism. They get baptized the right way. And then Paul lays his hands on them and they are filled in the Holy Spirit and the evidences of tongues and prophesying. And just to add on to that, you know, we cannot resign ourselves to an isolated view of Christianity. You might not see the immediate benefit of, of community, and, and, but, but it, it, it takes an act of faith to invest your time and energy with others. They might not be perfect, but this is, this is part of walking in the Spirit. This is part of Christianity is we are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet and the organs and each one of us. Each one of us is so valued in the body of Christ that we need each other. So what does this mean? Like this means, this means being, attending Sunday services. This means attending Bible studies, praying together, having mentors, and so on. Sometimes our introversion, our distrust of people, our social awkwardness, our insecurities, our deflated view of self can be used as, used as excuses, but it's, it can in fact be a blind spot in your life, like where the enemy can exploit this, saying that, well, I'm just uncomfortable around people. I'm just, I'm, I just feel awkward to just be vulnerable. I, I'm just awkward in front of, like, to, to connect, connect with people, and this becomes like a a blind spot for the enemy to isolate you because that's where the enemy finds you most weak is by yourself. And, and when you feel disconnected, alone, and, and away from people, he's able to target you and, and to keep you down, keep you in a state of malaise. So first is that we need to have a fellowship with mature believers. Second is that we need to develop a deep desire for the work of Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, earlier I mentioned a couple of Bible verses. Jesus' own promises to disciples for a helper to be with them forever. Do you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you sense His help, His power, His promptings, His voice, His leadings? If not, let me encourage you to seek and desire more of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you know, like I said before, Jesus said it would be better for Jesus to go so that the Holy Spirit could come. And, and at the time, it made no sense to the disciples, but later on, they understood that 
Jesus was conceived as the God-man in Mary's womb by the, by the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself was anointed by the Spirit and walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Paul expresses, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us. So we need to walk in the fullness of the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit just as much as we need Jesus, just as much as we need God the Father. And as we know, God is a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We need God. We need all of God. There's no other viable way of, of enduring this treacherous walk in this, in this world. There's no other viable way of doing the ministry of God without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like pushing a dead car up a, up a hill, trying to do ministry, trying to live this life without the power of the Holy Spirit. In the days to come, uh, in a couple of weeks or a week or so from now, we'll be, we'll be praying together as a church. And my ministry here is for the younger brothers and sisters here. And I, I just want to call each one of you to join along in this effort to fast for the 21 days. It starts with a desire. It starts with, it starts with a yearning in the heart to see a vision of where you want to see yourself in Christ. To see, to see, a, and, and this is for the entire church to pray to, that a, that a generation will rise up that is biblically knowledgeable, spirit-filled servants who desire above everything else to build up the body of Christ. So I encourage our younger people to join along in this effort and many uh, plans will come here, will be ex uh, explained to you uh, on what we can do to join along in the church's call to pray together. Now let me invite the worship team to come forward. The question to ask ourselves this morning is, are you a deficient disciple? These 12 disciples did not know what they didn't know. Right? They, they had no idea what they were missing. So maybe a light bulb has turned on in you to see things from a different perspective and to desire something more. Maybe it's, Lord, awaken in me a thirst for the word. Awaken in me a thirst for your Holy Spirit. So instead of being a deficient disciple, here's a, another way to look at it. We can become a desperate disciple. There will always be inefficiencies. There will always be immaturities that will pop up. Every time you, f you, you fix something by the power of the Holy Spirit, something else pops up. It, it, it's a lifelong process to, to grow and walk in the Lord. But rather than resigning and saying, well, that is just human nature and making that the norm, let us become desperate, desperate for God. First of all, we're not desperate about seeing... We're not desperate about seeing outcomes. We're desperate about God himself. One thing that I ask, one thing that I seek, I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. Our desires for God above everything else. Let us become desperate for the righteousness of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's become desperate to see a move of God in our lives, to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. For what? So that we can build up the body of Christ. God will give you a spiritual gift to build up another person. Do you desire that? Yes, you. God will use you to build up another person and He will give you the grace and the spiritual gift to enable you to do that. Are you desperate to... To, to lay down your life for someone else. Hallelujah. Let's become desperate to read the word. And the Psalms says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. To, to taste the sweetness of the word. Have you lost that taste? Is, it, is reading the word become cumbersome? Lord, give us a desperation to taste the word. The word is sweet to my taste. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, throne of grace, God. 
We come, O oh God, with a sense of desperation. We're seeking more of you, God. Primarily everything else, O oh God. We seek you this morning. And we pray, Lord God, as we seek you, Lord, help us to become desperate for your righteousness. Lord, desperate to see, to see God, you using us in a marvelous way to bless others. And Lord, and most of all, just to be desperate to he- know you more through your word. I pray in these days as we are uh, coming together to fast, coming together, Lord, to, to seek your face together, Lord God, unlike any other time before, Lord, I pray for a special move of the Holy Spirit, O Lord, amongst young and old alike, O Lord God. I pray not just for, O God, a, a joyful experience, but God, beyond that, O Lord, for people to be sent, people to be called, people to be empowered, O Lord, to be ministers, people, most unlikeliest people, O God, to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And I pray, O God, this with all faith, knowing, God, that you will come and you will, Lord, you come to those who seek you, O Lord. And I pray that that small desire to seek you, O God, will, be, will come upon your children this morning, O God. Hallelujah. We give you all the praise, glory, honor for all you have done, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.